Hello and welcome to the Examine Life podcast. My name is Kay He. This is a podcast where we look at some of life's thorniest questions so that we can help you lead a more productive, examined, and joyful life. Today's question, money, 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 money. Uh, we are going to talk about the question, how do you build long-term wealth? And I'm joined by my friend, my also happens to be my wealth advisor, Adam Katz. What's up, Adam? What's up, buddy? I feel like we've had a lot of these discussions, so it'll be fun to have some eavesdroppers. So, yeah, so you, you, the, to our listeners, you're probably wondering, like, examine life, building wealth. Come on, Kay, a little bait and switch here. Are you really going to, is this a get rich quick scheme? The get rich slow quick. <laughs> <laughs> Get rich slow scheme. What I love about this conversation is we're going to talk a lot about the difference between being rich and being wealthy. That's something that I know Adam works often with his clients and him and I have worked together, talked about this ad nauseum. So I'm going to actually kick it off. Instead of having Adam introduce himself, I've known Adam for, I'm going to, I'm going to tell the story about how, how Adam <laughs> and, I, and I met because it puts everything in context. So here's the story. I'm on my honeymoon. So this would be, I've been married 11 years. So I'm on my honeymoon 11 years ago. I'm in Bora Bora, and I get an email from our friend, Steve Byers. <laughs> Shout out, Steve Byers, if you're right. listening. And he says, hey, there's this great guy you should meet. His name's Adam Katz. He may or may not even have told me what you do. I go on LinkedIn, and I look at Adam's bio, or, or either it's in his signature or something, and it's like, a fucking wealth manager. Thanks a lot, Steve Byers. Like, I don't, I manage my money myself. I know a lot about finances. I'm not going to pay someone to manage my money. And come on, like, why didn't you check with me on all this? So, so that sets the stage for how we became friends. Another fucking wealth manager was the original context. This was 11 years ago. And since then, Adam, And this is a a beautiful story. I'll set it up and then I'll have you finish it. Adam had made a career switch 11 years ago. 13. 13 13 years ago. So I caught you 11 (laughs) 11 years ago. Yep. He had done this career switch. How How old were you 11 years ago? 30, well, right, no. So 11 years ago, I was 35, 36. 35. So you made a career switch at 32 into a business development role doing wealth management. And so really like, a new career, starting from scratch in terms of skill level, relationships, and so on. And he goes on uh, to build, the, Adam goes on to build this career at what was originally called the Bonner Sachs Group within yep. um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch. They then spin out, and then this year they get acquired. Needless to say, it's a phenomenal story of building long-term wealth for himself and his family, we're talking generational type wealth. So he has, Adam has a, a really first row seat to this process, both in his own life and in his client's life. And I think it's just an incredible, 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 and we, we're very close friends. It's an incredible story that, wow, 12 years, I don't know, some people might be 12 years, like that's not that long for, for a restart. And others would be like, 12 fucking years, when, when you start to hear the long game that was played, you're like, oh, that's a long well, fucking got, time. Yeah, Dan, Dana and I, Dana's my wife, we joke like there was five years of that journey that, I mean, we both have amnesia about, you know, the survivorship bias, which we all talk about in so many contexts for this role, couldn't be stronger. You know, there, there were years I was doing a thousand in-person meetings with nothing to show for it, at least in the mundane way my industry characterizes success with assets and revenue. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fill in the blank. Like you're at a cocktail party and someone's like, hey, so Adam, you know, how do you spend your time? They don't give the answer I give. What, uh, what's, (laughs) what's the pithy answer you give? Well, I don't go to a lot of cocktail parties. I I typically am guerrilla warfare. I have one-on-one meetings, which as, as I sort of said up front, it's sort of fun to, to use a megaphone for this discussion. I answer it in a way that Dana gets annoyed. I usually say I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like saying that is, A, I like to answer things in ways that are less obvious, but it also lets me realize if they even care. You and I both know, like, most of the time people don't actually care. They just want to talk about themselves, which is fine. And so depending on how it goes from there, 
I'll start talking about the kind of things I help people with if they're interested. And they're like, oh, wait, wait. You're not like a therapist like I thought. And I said, well, I am. I just don't use pharmaceuticals or a couch. And it starts getting fun because I always tried to occupy the proverbial seat of being a wealth advisor in a way that was less obvious, in a way that was way more sticky. And what I realized early on, and as Kay said, you know, I, I did, like any entrepreneur, you've got to have two qualities, tremendous optimism and tremendous naivety. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd never do it. And so, you know, my dad was a guidance counselor in the Bronx for 33 years, and he was a teacher at a Hebrew day school. It's not like, as Kay said, there was some obvious reason why I thought I could do business development. And I found myself, you know, after a couple of years out in New York City in sort of the 2010, 2011, 2012 vintage, meeting with a lot of entrepreneurs. And I found that they all were willing to meet with me because they all needed a lot of stuff. But what I realized pretty quickly was none of them needed me. And I'm like, huh, okay. And then I would meet with pretty wealthy people and they didn't need me either because they had another version of me. And, you know, Kay knows we have a, a sort of a fun framework I've worked on and written about almost a decade ago about seed planting versus tree shaking, which we might end up getting into. But anyway, so I started realizing that what I wanted to do is make myself immediately helpful and relevant. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, you know, classic Eisenhower matrix two by two, you know, how, what is, what is in all of these entrepreneurs important and urgent box? Mm -hmm. And I knew it wasn't me, right? Cause I didn't have any money. And I realized, you know, pretty quickly it was three main things. It was- Well, when needed, you say me, yeah. do you say, they need like they needed a skill of yours, a service of yours, or just like a friend or like a right, no, of yours. We're, 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 no, no, great, great question. They didn't need anyone to help them manage their money, which I probably sort of thought was my job at the time mm. because they didn't have any. Ah, and okay. so, and so, this I is said, important. Yeah, yeah, this is important. You're meeting entrepreneurs who don't have money yet, and I think this jives with kind of this is going to jive with our long game question. They right. don't have money yet. Okay. So they didn't need you and you had this Eisenhower matrix of so, important and urgent. So I started asking a lot of questions because that's what people do. And if you have as many meetings as I started to articulate, I did, you can start, you know, I, I say I do a lot of storming, a lot of, a lot of brainstorming with no specific rhyme or reason, but I'm really good at looking in the rear view to have pattern recognition and create framework. So very quickly, you know, after a few months, I'm like, all right, everyone seems to need three things. They all need capital for their business. They need talent for their team and they need revenue. None of this is rocket science, as I'm mm -hmm. sure people yeah. are hearing this. So then I said, well, how can I spend my day connecting them to those things with no financial remuneration for me, but just to keep myself in that important and urgent box to be a helper? And I mm -hmm. joked that no one ever rejects help. So if I could spend most of my day helping people with the things they've self-identified, which I've learned to anticipate, I barely ever got rejected in a role that should get rejected by definition 99% of the day. Yeah. And, and, and it puts you in a way better mood to be a, a way better dad, a way better husband. It, it, Kate didn't mention when I did this career switch, you know, already had two kids, proverbial mortgage, like the classic entrepreneur risk-taking thing. You know, you sort of fast forward a little bit and I became a helper in the tech community. Uh, it confused a lot of people because most people, you know, I joke that it would be unattractive to say, hey, my name's Adam Katz, I'm short-term transactional guy. Mm -hmm. But most people are. You know, people want to be long-term, but it's hard to be. It's both quite quite literally hard to be long-term from a financial perspective. And, it's, and our brains are wired for instant gratification, not delayed. I always say, if you look at the next year as only 5% of the next 20 or 100% of the next one, it can really change the way you think about time. So I was always good at transporting myself, sort of flux capacitor. Say that again, 5% of, five, five of the next 20 or 1%. So that's or one no, year. Or a or 100 of the next one year. Oh, 100. Okay. Got so it. So if you think about this next year as everything that ever would possibly matter, because it's 100%, you create so much urgency. Whereas if you're able to jump ahead five years, 20 years, in my first example, this next year isn't that urgent, and mm -hmm. I'm going to be patient. Mm -hmm. And I was really good at somehow transporting my brain. And I'd always say that because people would say, dude, why are you willing to help me? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know, because over the next five to 10 years or 20 years, if you're 
you know, if things work out as well as I hope they do for you and as well as maybe your investors do, I don't know if you're a client in the back 17, that's still 85% of our relationship. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And I always thought that way. It's hard to mm -hmm. act that way, but I was always good at at least thinking that way. And in hindsight, really did act that way. So let me pa let me pause you there because I think that there's so many things to to, to pick out. Pick <laughs> well, out Kay, Kay and I could talk for ten hours, so we're trying to cram this in. Yeah. I know. So so you you're you enter this new role where your business development and 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 to to be fair to put in layperson's term, business development in uh, wealth management context is getting new clients. Correct. Right. Is that, okay. So your 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 job is to get new or clients. New, or new assets from existing clients, but I had or, no existing clients. <laughs> okay. So you're in this new role and you come in and the way asset managers, wealth managers get paid is percentage of assets under management. So you bring in a new whale client and then you start getting you manage the money and you start getting assets. This is start getting revenue. But you do something opposite. You say, I'm going to look for people, and this, is, this comes back to our question, yeah. how do you build long-term wealth? You look at people and you said, I think you're going to be rich or successful in 10 years, 5, 15, and then you say, until that point, I'm going to help you for free. So two questions. One is, did, you know, did I get that right? And then the second question is, didn't your bosses say to you, I don't care about revenue in 15 years. I want <laughs> revenue today. How did you? Yeah. Did no, it's great. So you did get it correct. I was, I was a little crazy about my philosophy. And I remember sitting with another common friend of ours, uh, Mark H., and about five years in, and he's like, dude, this is such a brilliant way of thinking. But like, how are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm in like the top 1% of any advisor who started when I did five years ago. He's like, wait, wait, that's so inconsistent. And I will explain to you how that happened along the way. And so what I didn't anticipate was by becoming a helper, and, and I guess I'll use the tree shaking versus seed plantings. I think it'll be very helpful for this. So when I got into the business, I thought you go onto the, onto the big field, find the most lush tree you could possibly see, and you sprint to it. And if you think about, in a quite literal and figurative way, those leaves were the money. And so I thought, you know, you see the biggest tree possible and you go and shake it and try to get some of it off. And, you know, trees were pretty far away. As you get closer to the tree, like, ah, there's already like a ring or two of tree shakers doing it because it's pretty visible and easy. So I'm like, oh, okay, I can't get close to the tree. Maybe I'll be creative and I'll throw some stuff at the tree. <laughs> or maybe I'll get out a saw. And as you could imagine, that's not really a, a very fulfilling day. I'll fight. So, I'll like, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> MMA fight the people right, around exactly, the tree. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'll arm wrestle them, which is a whole other thing for us to talk about. But then what would happen is by accident, again, along with the analogy, I'd find myself on the other side of the field where no one was because there was nothing visible to shake. And instead, there was something beneath the surface, which was the seed. And that was all these founders. It was all these entrepreneurs I was meeting in the New York ecosystem in pretty early days. And they needed sustenance, whether it was that capital, whether it was that talent for their team, whether it was revenue. And I was the provider of the sustenance. And my view was in three years, five years, 10 years, these seeds would become saplings and eventual trees. The difference, though, is as everyone starts running over, I'm already part of the trunk and the root system. So that was yeah. my goal, right? And a very long-term view and, and quite analogous to a venture capitalist. I always sort of joke that I'm like a venture capitalist. Mm -hmm. Problem is, and we can talk about this too, I don't have a permanent spot on the cap table, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is a little tricky sometimes. But in general, what I didn't realize to be able to tie this together is so right. My goal was I got to survive along the way, right? I'm not going to be wealthy along the way. And we will dig into wealth because wealth is not linear and it is not one dimensional. Um, but I was starting to find success along the way because think about how gratifying it is when you connect all these people. And Kay and I, which we sort of jumped over at one point, probably for a good 12 months, may have been making five intros to each other every week. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, at one point, I think I had, I don't want to go into too much of a tangent, but I think I had like 173 folders mm -hmm. in Kay's folder in my Outlook 
meaning that's how many people I met through K. And I at one point stopped because it was exhausting to categorize them anymore. But again, moving back, so if you go back to the seed planting versus tree shaking, what was interesting was along the way, some of those lush trees, where they go is not to the shakers. They go inside their own trunk and root system. And a lot of them underneath the surface were connected to all of my trees that were already mm. growing. So like a lot of my founders were really influential, smart people that a lot of their angel investors or venture capitalists or you know families, they really thought a lot of them, even though they weren't wealthy yet, and yeah. they would ask them, hey, who do you, do you know anyone who could do this? So suddenly I started getting intros to people that already were quite wealthy and they needed me a little bit differently, but that's what allowed me to survive along the way was that I started meeting all these people that most people were trying to shake the tree, but because of the connectivity of all the people I was helping, I would get these really warm intros sort of out of nowhere after a few years. And that's what I didn't anticipate. And it makes perfect sense when you think yeah. about it, but I didn't, I didn't actually anticipate that my proverbial J curve of my career, mm -hmm. that the trough could be more mitigated than I anticipated it would be. Got it. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna translate and distill some of the things that some Please, of the yeah. things that you said. So, Adam, instead of running to the obvious target, the whale, let's say, and to use casino parlance, you're like, I'm gonna find the next whale, and I'm gonna. I'm going to call, but this is the important thing is like, I'm going to cultivate these relationships based on service. And these are my words, not yours, but I, I think you'll relate service, helpfulness. I would even add the word, the L word, love and, and genuine care with this, this crazy part. This is like your crazy wiring. This is people <laughs> not going to, they're not going to understand this. But you genuinely, and I can say this because I've known you for so long, you genuinely didn't expect anything in return. And I think this is, this is we're talking about how to build long-term wealth. I think that people, there's going to be a subset of people listening to this, and they're like, yeah, but like in the back of your mind, you were like, this person owes me. This person better come around. And I know that you said to yourself, you're like, if they come around, great. You're not doing it 100% out of the goodness of your heart, but I don't know, 98% out of the goodness of your heart. And so, so this leads to two things. One is when you do something out of the goodness of your heart, it actually releases this like these chemicals and life just becomes really enjoyable when you watch other people succeed. That's one thing. The second thing though is when other people succeed, you get caught in their wake of success, wakeboarding, mm -hmm. or to use more startup language, there's actually an insane amount of network effects. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is like, you help this person, you help them help, 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 help. And, and we can talk about what that actually looks like. And then they're like, wow, this person's really helpful. Who are nine other smart people that need help? Correct. And then you rinse and repeat and I'll plant a seed because you said, you know, you did a thousand meetings a year. You made this passing comment. And, and, and I think that's <laughs> a, we shouldn't, we'll talk about this part, but like there's just a, the sheer volume of, I, I don't want to gloss over the sheer volume of reps. I did my solo episode. And I, I, I think I said I had like 5,000 networking meals right, over yeah. my career. Like you just, like you can't underestimate that you just got to fucking show up. Oh, you yeah. Know? And, and, I think, and by the yeah. way, and, I mean, the muscle memory you and I, and, you know, Kay and I sort of went through parts of this journey together. I would say the whole thing, but like there's parts of this where we really were feeding off of each other's enthusiasm for connections. You know, mm -hmm. your, your phrase of accelerating serendipity is right. The amount of people that you and I put together that mm -hmm. probably amounted to years of acceleration of amazing things happening can't be, you and I have no idea, because again, we weren't doing for it, we weren't tracking it that way. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of people, some that might even be listening today that would say, yeah, like by those guys putting us together. And, but the muscle memory you get, you know, again, can't be understated. And, you know, to say, like I had an activity goal when I started up front, as I said, sort of the mundane assets and revenue. I always said, 
in my industry, that's a massive lagging indicator of success. You know, I felt so successful for so many years going to what you said, because by positioning myself to be this helper, like when you talk about wealth, and we will get into that, my days were amazing for so many years. And it was so confusing to some of my colleagues who were way more successful than me, again, in the pure financial sense. A lot of their clients were confused because they're like, I know I'm probably much wealthier than Adam, but he seemed much happier than I am. And so, you know, it was me always <laughs> thinking about wealth quite differently than just financial wealth. And, and as you know, at this point, and we can dig into this right now or over time, you know, financial wealth is not wealth. It is a mm-hmm. gateway to real wealth. And, and you know, I, I have two ways of saying it. Real wealth is getting up every day, doing what you want, where you want, with who the fuck you want. Mm-hmm. And the real ways I talk about it is time wealth, autonomy wealth, and health wealth. And I tell, without intentionality, you'll never access them. Because inertia, as we know, is one of the strongest forces on this planet. And so where I have so much fun is coaching my clients how to reorient their relationship to that to money so that they can access those forms of wealth. And, mm-hmm. and you know the way I think about my role is, is pretty two-way interview, that if people think that's hokey, I'm like, that's fine. There's like 99.9% of people who have the same title of what I do that, that'll talk to you about the S&P and beating it. I'll never talk about that, right? Mm-hmm. My, my job is to help you access real wealth. And I yeah. think, you know, you and I can dig into that in a few different ways. But, you know, again, it was really positioning myself along the way, redefining success mm-hmm. in a business development function where people didn't really get it. As you said, you know, I would have people like calling people behind the scenes being like, I don't get it. Like Adam, like did all this stuff for me. Like, what's his angle? Like, where's his commission? And they're mm-hmm. like, he doesn't have one. And, you know, candidly, usually those people that were asking it were short-term transactional yeah. people. Like, so couldn't even fathom someone would be wired the way I was and the way you were. Uh, so let me ask you this. If, if, like, sir. people are listening to this and they're hearing, oh, these guys are good networkers. Or they're hearing, you know, they're, they're good at building relationships. What's, what do you tell, I don't know, let, let's, pick a, let's pick an avatar. Let's take someone who's mid-30s working at a fang startup, highly, highly, you know, paid well, W-2. And it's like, how do I, not necessarily looking to be his a, a founder, but wants to embody this spirit of, you know, what I call spirit of generosity. Mm-hmm. And so you're mentoring this, this young guy, gal, and they're like, yeah, okay, I, I get what you guys are saying. How would I do that? What does that look like for me? Like, what would you tell that? I'm sure you've had these mentoring conversations. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. You know, again, as you know, I've got a million different frameworks, but I think about a life pie, right? We all only are given 24 hours, seven days. And I think, again, sort of coming out of college, your life pie is typically sort of one piece. It's like you. (laughs) It's like the most selfish, not in a bad way, but like, you know, you're just working out, you're seeing people, you're figuring it out. And I think that as time goes on, you know, I think a lot about stage of life and age and why there's high correlation. It's not perfectly synonymous, but assume you're in your mid-30s, there's a good chance you're married. So new entrant to the life Mm -hmm. pie is your spouse. By definition, other things have to shrink. You might have a kid, Again, other things need to shrink. So I feel like, you know, a lot of times, and I actually remember having this discussion with with someone a while ago, you know, you've got to say, hey, how do I spend my day that really helps both my mental health and my physical health? Mm-hmm. And I think that the, we'll just say dopamine hit you get out of a mentor discussion can't be understated. You know, and I would have certain discussions and a lot of times the mentor ones that were really far afield, like, if you were a founder that sort of felt like, hey, Adam, I, Adam's out there in the founder network. He seems to be just a helper and awesome. But like, I do a lot of like just straight up mentor conversations, right? I give anyone a half an hour and be helpful. And, you know, it's funny, you get off a call like that and someone might say, why, why do you take a half hour to talk to me if you don't mind me asking? And I get that question, you know, dozens and dozens of times. So I would say, let's pretend it was UK. I'd say, Kay, do you, did you, did, did I look, did I look like I was smiling? Like, yeah. I said, how did you feel during this call? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I felt good. I said, did you think that you were smiling at me? You're like, I, I, I hope I was. You know, what do you think your body language looked like? Mm-hmm. They're like, I don't know. I probably looked pretty engaged. I'm like, so how do you think that made me feel? Mm-hmm. They're like, I don't I, I hope it made you feel good. I'm like, felt fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. So, Kay, 
you're thinking about this backwards. I just used you to put mm -hmm. myself in a better mood. Mm -hmm. To then be, again, an amazing dad, an amazing business partner, an amazing advisor, an amazing husband. So I think part of what I teach people is, you know, by being a helper, don't underestimate how good it will feel and will energize you for other things. So it may look like a piece of your life pie you don't have time for, mm -hmm. but if you find places for you to be the giver with no expectation of anything in return, I would believe that the utility of that back to you for some of that health wealth is massive. So wow. I feel like I stumbled upon it sort of by accident. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to spend as much of my day as possible. So I think by being able to coach some of the people that you and I get to meet and say, hey, whether it's something in your community, whether it's around some expertise you happen to have in an industry, whether it's around a hobby, whether it's around you know, your alma mater, like there's so many ways and angles where just like find a place that you can be the person that's the helper mm -hmm. and you will get so much out of that half hour and then be intentional about it. Have an activity goal. Say, hey, my goal is to do it once a week. And if you do it twice a month, okay, you failed by 50%, but it's still 24 times mm -hmm. in the year and do that four years and you've done it a hundred times. And again, that's the reps that you and I talk about, and it's the jumping forward in time, looking backwards, looking at these bite sizes that have massive cumulative effect. Yeah, I love that. And and you know, we're again, it's like, how do you build long term wealth? It's well, the, the the starting point is you have to think in long terms. And so I would say that you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because. We, we were doing, helping all these people out. We were organizing events and dinners, running around you were, New York City. You were organizing, brother. Yeah. I just showed up, which yeah. I so appreciate. <laughs> you showed up with, 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 the, with the great people. But funny enough is that's actually the same spirit of Rad Reads. Mm -hmm. Because it really started. <laughs> now you have 45,000 people, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, a, yeah, but no, which you, no, which no you, AUM by the way, fee. You, know, you, you, yeah, but you, by the way, undercut that, man. I mean, I, I remember the first 24 people or whatever it was, which I was part of. And, yep. you know, what you've built, you know, it's been, you know, I'll say it without it sounding condescending, but so proud and, and happy for you because you've accessed real wealth. And even though there is not a non-zero part of you that doesn't look at the alternate, you know, 1984 version of, you know, Back to the Future. Yeah, there's an alternate version that Kay could have taken. But man, when you talk about time wealth and autonomy wealth and health wealth, you have used your financial wealth as a crazy gateway for those things. And yeah. the envy that people have, not only for your crazy cut eight pack, <laughs> Which, dude, there's so many people out there that have $100 million that would probably swap half of it, if not more, to look like you. Um, but also, you know, you, you, you govern your day. Your day doesn't govern you. And yeah. you are so intentional and so confusing to mm. your peers and mentors that they're like, wait, wait, wait. I remember even having this discussion with you, maybe even on the day you did it, because I was actually with Kay the day he, he moved yeah. on from Wait, can, let, 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 can we zoom out oh, here? Sorry, because sorry, I want to <laughs> set the stage, because this is, I've been meaning, I think this would just be so fun to talk about, because so many of my listeners have followed my story for a long time, so they kind of know, so you, you know, assume that they kind of, they, they know who I am. Then last week, or two weeks ago, I released an episode that was very personal, where I basically lifted the financial kimono, and like, this is how much I had when I left, 4.3 million bucks. This is what I made the last three years that I worked on Wall Street. It was like 1. 1. 1. 1.1, I forget, 1.7, 2.3, and 1.3 were the last three years. And, and then I quit at 35 years old. And you, you were the only person besides <laughs> Lisa that knew those numbers. Correct. <laughs> and so listen to hold that. On, I always hold on, hold on. I always tell people when people, you know, because Kay and I had such an intertwined community, there was, you know, a fair amount of people that just thought he was crazy because by him leaving the train, it by definition sort of attacks their own decisions they've made by staying on. It's a very implicit slight, which we can talk about. But I always would say this to people. I'm like, well, my guess is Kay made a lot more than you think he did, and he spent a lot less than you do. <laughs> mm, yeah, and, and I think that that's beautiful because it kind of like it does. That was my look, answer. Look, five five million bucks, four million bucks at age thirty five is a lot of fucking money, even in yes. New York City. Yes, and those were some some big paydays. But here's the question I asked her: So you work 
you were coaching me you as a friend. We weren't working together at that time. Right. But so I quit. I'm 35. And you know that I had no plan was to just try shit. What White did, space, baby. If you could rewind into that moment. So it's been eight years. How did you think those eight years, knowing what you knew about me then, knowing, you know, you'd been around a lot of entrepreneurs even at that point. Yeah. How did you think my life was going to play out over those eight years? Not nearly as well as it has. Oh, wow. Whew. Yeah. No, and what I mean by that is as I coach so many entrepreneurs and career switchers, I implore people to use white space. And most people get so anxious, and you and I have some friends like this that you would know, that they're so anxious to have the proverbial business card immediately. No. Because we can't help but define ourselves in most society, like, what do you do for a living? Which is why, as I said, I joke, I answer, I'm a therapist, because I just, I hate the question. I never ask people what they do for a living. I ask people how they spend their day. I think you and I have, like, that's how I ask people what yep. they do. How do you spend your days? And so... I didn't know what you were going to do. What I did know, though, was that you would be methodical. I knew you would be a zealot. I was a little worried about how you would do with the balance of life, the intertwining of life. And that's what I guess I'm saying is I could have never imagined that you'd surf two hours a day, meditate an hour. Dude, that is, that's wealth, man. I mean, you know, there's so many people listening to this that, you know, they can't even get their head around. Like, that's how you get to spend your days on this planet. We only get one shot, right? Mm. Forget some of the really cool space exploration ideas, right? We all get yeah. one shot on this planet. And time is time. And, you know, to think that you in your 30s, with probably 50 to 60 years left on the planet, said, I'm going to spend a lot of my time in the ocean. I'm going to spend a lot of time with my girls as they're growing up. I'm going to be really intentional about my marriage and my, my parents and my friends. That's wealth. And, and again, I think some of it you did without even realizing you were doing it as well as you did it. And, you know, again, you had a base of assets that you know, to some people would not at all come close to sustain their lifestyle, but you've been smart. You know, you, you can generate, you know, a couple of hundred grand off of that, whether through appreciation or obviously some, some yield. You supplemented it with different ebbs and flows of income, and you've geared your lifestyle where, you know, you're hanging out not where you live for this summer. You're, you know, you, you went on those unbelievable trips. I mean, you know, we, we forget about those. You went on those uh, awesome trips. So... You know, I feel like when I say not as well, it's not that I didn't think you would do great. Obviously, I didn't know what you were going to do with it. I also love that you didn't get enamored with building a product. Mm, yeah. And I feel like back then, given our intertwined l life with the tech community, you know, I feel like there was, hey, I should go build a thing and mm. sell it. And, you know, I feel like what you ended up doing was really melding together all your superpowers into what you do. So, man, I think there's a lot of people with a healthy envy of what mm -hmm. you've built. And believe me, a lot of the parallel paths of K that may have had maybe an extra comma mm -hmm. in the bank wouldn't look so good, wouldn't yeah. know their kids so well, and wouldn't have seen a lot of the planet and or the sea like you have. Oh, man. Well, th thank you, because I, I do, it, it, it's funny, it's like, you know, there's that succession piece, it's like five million bucks, you know, it's like, <laughs> the, it's like the poorest rich man in the planet, where it's like, look, I, I, and let's call a spade a spade, you know, yes, if I wanted to live in rural wherever, send mm -hmm. my kids to public school, public mm -hmm. university, I never would have to live, lift a finger again. Correct. But... I fucking love cities. Yep. <laughs> I love traveling. I yep. love concerts. I love, you know, I don't particularly like, my, you and I know, cars. I don't like cars. And I beat myself up because I look at people who I hired, mm -hmm. like out of college. Mm -hmm. And they have way more money than me. But they don't and, have way more wealth. Yeah. So I just want to want to put this out at a very, very human level. I'm not saying this to like, win, you know, appreciation or sympathy points uh, for, for anyone. But like, you heard what Adam said about my life. And I'm so grateful about that. And I look at my peers with envy, not all the time. And the amount of time that I do it is 
less and less and less over the years, right? You know, people will always ask me, they're like, hey, and I'm curious, because you said, you said, I, I know people, you made it, I, I love how you talk subtly about, about money and wealth. You're like, I know people <laughs> with an extra comma than you that would be, blah, you know, want to have your life or something like that, which is basically like someone with, this is where my math breaks down, but it was like tens or hundreds of more millions. Hundreds. Hundreds, hundreds. more millions. See, that's how bad I am. I'm like once I can't even play the next comma of math. But <laughs> the thing that I always go back to, and I've really been leaning hard into this now because I have become convinced that there is nothing. We were talking about this about lunch. There is nothing that I could buy or achieve that would change my baseline, my long-term baseline of happiness. And like, I, I want to write a book. I want this podcast to do well. I, maybe I'd get like a rental house near a, a nice surf break. <laughs> but I know in my bones that the inner game of happiness, the inner game of fulfillment would not be changed. It, there'll be a spike and then it will it will mean reverse. Right. So you so you know my and this is a lot of my teachings because <clears throat> I work with mostly venture backed entrepreneurs that if things go, I always say as well as they hope they do, as well as their investors hope they do, they'll have step function wealth creation, mm -hmm. where immediately the marginal utility of a dollar for consumptive life goes to zero. Yeah. And that is something that people will not feel bad for for people, mm -hmm. but man, that is a daunting concept. Yeah. And that's where I spend most of my time coaching is because of my, my clients tend to be so young and we do some really cool structuring for asset protection and wealth transfer and income and estate tax, which, as you know, is where I nerd out. You know, it, it's crazy what will happen with compounding, right? Mm -hmm. If money doubles every, you know, 12 years at 6%, proverbial law 72, you know, you get that kind of windfall, 50 million, 100 million bucks when you're in your 30s. Mm -hmm. I mean, you die a billionaire. And mm -hmm. I probably have structured in a way that, you know, you're saving God knows what in, in the state tax. Mm -hmm. So the, the daunting part is what else do you do with your money? Mm -hmm. And you know that I have a couple of frameworks around this. One I know you talked about as it relates to sort of how many digits we all pay attention mm -hmm. into in our account, which we can dig into. But the other one that I think is really, really interesting is the concept of porting numerators onto different denominators. And you know I spent a lot of time on this. So at some point, once that utility curve flattens, which as you said, like there's only so many pairs of sneakers you can wear. Mm -hmm. You know, you get 15 pairs of amazing kicks and you wear like your five favorite every time because you don't like, you like feel like you're missing out and not looking as good if you're not wearing them. There's only so many cars you can drive. And you know, I happen to love cars, but you know, there's still only so many cars you can drive. You're going to wish you're driving your favorite car every time and people don't have to commute as much anymore. So they don't need like a snow, snow rover. And like, there are only so many places you can, vi so and like a restaurant doesn't get more expensive because your denominator got bigger. So it's weird. Mm -hmm. Money becomes unfun again. People aren't mm -hmm. having sympathy, which I get. Can you explain that? Like the diminishing margin. So we're so you know your clients are f u wealthy. Do you think this diminishing utility of money basically means that a, you know the next dollar is not worth as as much, right? And and you could say like if you're very satisfied with your life. Like if you think you have everything, and again, you could be a billionaire or you could be someone, you know, at the poverty line. But if you are completely satisfied with your life, you need to question what that next dollar Correct. is worth and, to and, you. And that's where, you know, my concept of numerators and denominators sort of gets fun. Meaning I'll use my water droplet analogy because I think okay. that helps and then I'll marry it back to something more tangible. So if you think about a water droplet living in a bathtub. And then you think about the same water droplet living in a, a glass, and then that same water droplet living in a thimble. You can't see it at all in the bathtub. I'd argue you barely, if at all, can see it in, in the glass, but you can probably start seeing it in the thimble. But it's still the same water droplet. So if at some point your bathtub, you can't even see your water droplets, you say, why wouldn't I take it out of there and go put it in a thimble where it's visible? And, and the tangible thing is maybe you want to help some other people. Mm -hmm. Whether quite literally, you know, I have this concept of random acts of daily financial kindness, which we can talk about, but then there's just straight up charitable support. Mm -hmm. And you start saying, wait, hold on, like the margin utility of a dollar sitting in this person's pocket is way more valuable to me. And that's where unitization of money starts coming in with mm -hmm. 
this three-digit concept and, and which we can jump into. But I think it's once you start, and listen, I, I, I recognize that there's some tone deferry to some of this discussion. It's not meant to be. It's super self-aware, both of us. You know, and I would imagine that at a lot of levels, people start saying, oh, wait, you know, my relationship to a $10 bill mm-hmm. is probably different now than it was when I was a kid or my relationship yeah. to 100. And then you start thinking about, am I still tethered and anchored to using those units the way I did 10, 20, 30 years ago when my denominator was so different? And maybe I can take those water droplets or take those new units and put them somewhere else. And, and you go back to forget the time and the mentorship and how you feel about that, man. You know, you go and help some people, help some family, help some friends, do an amazing, cool trip, you know, help, help something from a charitable perspective. It's going to give you so much more value yeah. and joy and dopamine than that next pair of sneakers or that, you know, di- different dinner and so I think that's the kind of stuff that I love teaching, and that's a big part of how I spend my day is living this way, but then then helping you know clients, again, untether themselves so they can use their wealth in, in a very different way. And here, here's where I think you know, the conversation applies to anyone that has had a fundamental shift in their f- uh, financial position. So you know, I grew up lower middle class, like I was born kind of lower middle, graduated middle, middle class. And now I'm, you know, 1% or whatever, you know, upper class. Or, um, You're even uncomfortable explaining yeah, it. Yeah. I know. Well, it's, it's it's such okay. a weird thing <laughs> to, to like put a label on it, especially when you live in New York or LA. It's Agreed. Like, what Agreed. is wealth in those cities? Yep. But I think I, as you were talking, I was like, I still have these arbitrary rules about things. Like I have a rule in my head that, sunglasses can't cost more than $200. It's asinine. If you like, I mean, sunglasses are a pretty service, you know, I'm not like trying to be a a model or anything, but sunglasses are serviceable. Like you get a lot of utility out of a good pair of sunglasses. But in my mind, this is where you're so helpful. It's like, there's a conditioning that is like, if I spend $500 on sunglasses, I'm fucking, something's wrong with me. Right. right. Yet, and yet then, you, yet you and I both know you can't tell me down to five thousand dollars. Exactly. What's sitting and in we're going to come to that, which is, is right. Is the we're going to come to that. Another one that I think a lot of people have is with travel. Correct. It's like you know, there's even on Twitter people are like I am so sick of like flight takes, which is like someone's take on like flying business or flying first or like upgrading and and so on. And here's here's why I'm still stuck because. To me, this is like my, you know, my younger <laughs> self talking. It's like the trip starts when I get to the destination. But really, the trip should start the minute I walk out the door of my house. And so that would change like what kind of car picks you up? Like, do you fly first? Do you fly business? Do you fly so on? And so, so Watch we, we this. Were, Wait, well, I'm going to have okay. a fun. We're going to okay. have fun with this because okay, let's do it. I, no, this is fun. So. I think because of, again, numerators and denominators, people can't help but find themselves into sort of relative discussions, percentage constructs. So if you were going on a vacation where the resort and all the food cost 15 grand and your flights cost 1000 it's a $16,000 vacation. But if instead you found the resort and the food for twelve grand. And you wanted to fly first class for four grand, it's still a sixteen thousand dollar vacation. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, you struggle with the three hundred percent change over the thousand, going from a thousand to four thousand. Oh yeah, it's still the same dollars. It's still those same droplets of water, but you've yeah. decided to give them more value or less because you've put them over a different denominator. Yeah. So, so I'm going to give you a more fun one. That's okay. so that this is my so this really cool ice cream shop opened up in our town, which sadly closed recently about five years ago. And I started hearing people being like, "I'm not going there." The ice cream cones are like fifty percent more than than other places. I'm like, "Oh, how how much are the ice cream cones?" And they're like six dollars. Said, "Okay, how many of those do you think you're going to have this summer?" Right? People are kind of like ten. I said, "Okay." So for like I don't know, like twenty five bucks a summer. You don't want to have the right to have a better ice cream cone. Mm. And again, it's like, would you notice the $25 
on a vacation budget, on a car budget, on a house budget. No, still the same droplet of water. But when we start putting, and that's like my favorite, like when you're negotiating a house, people are negotiating increments of 25 and 50 grand sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe a yeah. hundred grand. Yet you're like, no, I'm not spending an extra three grand on that flight. And yeah. so, and again, listen, you can't have a decision tree with the word and between every branch. Most people can't. Mm -hmm. I live in the world of and, not the world of or with my clients, which is important. But even with the ors, there's still a lot of ands. And so I think that, you know, by untethering people, but again, it's not to be frivolous. It's for two yeah. things. It's to create more of a frictionless lifestyle, accessing time wealth, autonomy wealth, and health wealth. And I think we would all agree that sleep is one of the most important parts of health. And if you're going on a vacation and you can get more sleep on that flight, I'm, I might argue that it's totally a great use of the wealth. And then the other side of it is, again, using some of that wealth in a very different way to help people. So again, this random acts of daily financial kindness and or charity. And to me, you know, quite personally, that's become way more exciting to me than the next pair of sneakers or another car. And I happen to like both of those, as you know. But I love surprising and delighting people on a daily basis in the service community with these random acts of daily financial kindness. And I love the charitable piece. And as you know, you know, my kids are older than at least most of my clients' kids. And so, like, I really sort of practice on them. I think we all mm -hmm. practice on our kids because we don't have enough to have a, a true sample. And I love talking about this stuff with them, as you know. Yeah. Well, and so, so let's talk about the the, the three the three digit rule. So <laughs> I, I, we, I tweeted about this. Personally, I know more people who struggle to spend money proportionate to their income and assets than those whose problem is they spend too much money. And so I think that's just a, a starting frame of like the type I of agree. person that listens that listens to, to me to, to this podcast and, and reads rad reads. And so you have this rule, and I it's really my wife said to me <laughs> over this trip, she's like, you haven't pushed back on any purchase. And by the way, I'm having one of my worst financial quarters. As I think I, I I had to like replenish. I had to go into savings this this quarter for for for. Ex Brad Reed's expenses. That's the, how d dire it's been in, in this quarter. And she said, you haven't worried. You haven't pushed back on a single purchase. Flight changes, upgrades, Ubering here instead of renting a car, this and this and this. And it's because you told me the three-digit rule, which I have been following. So why don't you share? And we'll include the, the, the post in, in the show notes. Yeah. And so, you know, I want to, I want to caveat it with, this isn't perfect, but directionally, I think it could be really empowering for people. So what started happening was I was on the phone with clients, you know, years ago, and I was pushing them to enjoy life more. And again, some of that enjoyment is to upgrade some of the ways they're traveling. Sometimes it's to be more charitable. Sometimes it's to help family. And so what happened was I was pushing always on vacations because I think it's hard, again, to untether from a vacation budget, right? Kay's got his 200 bucks on the sunglasses. I remember my vacation was like three to five grand. And like I sort of was, and then I remember the first time it was over 10 grand and I was like, Jesus. And so like, I think it's just natural. You have a little bit of creep there, maybe a lot of it, depending on who's listening. But then I would, I would watch, you know, these clients go from having, you know, again, it's way more lottery winning trajectory of what I work with from an anal analogy than just a constant earner like you were. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're sitting there with $50 million and you're planning that vacation and you think you're being extreme because the last vacation you took cost eight grand and you're like, all right, fine, I'll spend 20 grand. Because you're like, it's more than double. Like, I'm, I'm embracing what you told me, Adam. And I'll be like, no, nah, you should spend 50. And I'm like, what? Why would I spend that much? It's ridiculous. And then what I would say to them immediately is, oh, can you, can you tell me down to 42 grand what's in your account right now? And they'd start laughing. And I'd say, can you tell me down to 420,000 what's in your account now? And they're like, no. I said, sorry. So if you can't tell me down to that unit a couple of things. First off, you don't have a right to keep it there anymore. Let's put it somewhere else that'll have way more utility, whether it's on this vacation budget, whether it's to help your parents, whether it's to help that charity you've been telling me about. And then it made me realize that as you get more and more digits in your net worth or your proverbial bank account, we all as human nature go to the left and we look by a few digits. And I came up with three 
Because I felt like if you have $183,000 or $1.83 million or eighteen point three, I don't think most people go to the next digit. But what's weird and massively uncomfortable is when you're up to $18.3 million, you're like, wait, wait, the next one would be $18.4 million. Am I rounding by $100,000 units? Where when I had $183,000, I was rounding by $1,000 units. Yep. And you're like, oh, that's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I push people and say, so what, what's your emotional attachment to the old unit? If you can't even see it anymore, you can't even see the drop. But, and the crazy thing is, in the world we live in, starting to use $100 units, which again, for most of the people I work with, is, is really, it's in an invisible unit. Yeah. And you think about tacking that on to a normal tip at a restaurant, where maybe the normal tip would have been 50 bucks and you give 150 bucks. And people are like, Jesus, Sam, that's ridiculous. I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, you can't see the $100, but maybe that additional tip for someone who you felt deserved it, you know, made their day or a week or month. Mm -hmm. And and you don't need, and maybe you can do that for a couple of hundred people a year. Yeah. For again, even a unit in totality of 20 grand, which again, in my example, you can't even see your 20 grand unit. Mm -hmm. So again, rarefied air, but I think mm -hmm. this is so relatable and can transcend wealth levels where maybe it's the $10 unit. Maybe yeah. it's the hundred dollar unit, and then it and it frees you up. Like you're going to an awesome concert, and you're getting back. Like I was the other day, you know, all the way from City Field back to Jersey. Disaster after Pink, who I would say is a super cool show. She flies through the air. If anyone hasn't seen this, it's one of the craziest I've seen, things. There's ever. A I've seen the uh, Amazon Prime documentary. What's awesome is I didn't know it happened because I'm so oblivious, and all of a sudden she starts <laughs> flying around. But anyway, like to pay the extra couple hundred dollars to have the bigger, more comfortable uber with a few of my friends like that's a no-brainer yeah yet it's three or four times what it should have cost if i used like an uber x mm -hmm. and and so that's like a good example where it made the evening so much more pleasant there was no stress as yeah. the last few songs were going i wasn't worried about having to get out of there i wasn't mentally gone trying to be stressed about it as i think i've told you i always thought baseball games had seven innings because that's when we always left because that, that imparting of stress. So like, that's the kind of stuff that some people would say, Adam, that's wasteful, man. I'll never do the, the XL Suburban. That's ridiculous. I'll just do the X. And I'll push and say, well, why? And they'll say, well, because I don't need it. I'm, I'm comfortable in it. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I think it's more comfortable like this. And, and it wasn't the certainty of knowing. So like, I think that's the kind of stuff that by that, that three-digit rule, if you challenge yourself to think about your relationship to money as a kid, presuming that you've increased your wealth at a level that was different, you should say, am I still tethered to my old units? And is that helping me or hurting me? Yeah. And, and I think that, that that's the, the, the beautiful thing. Again, the rule, I mean, technically the rule is 10 basis points if you want to be really scientific about it. <laughs> but that's, that's so complicated. You're like, you know, no one's going to actually multiply, even multiplying by 0.1% is, is, it's not easy to do mm -hmm. quickly. But I think, it, it does get into this like weird thing about money, which is these like these old anchors. Like the, the anchors is a really is a really powerful one. This also there's this like scarcity belief that's like totally. Oh, if I get one Uber XL, the next thing you know, we'll only take Uber XLs, and then we're gonna be poor. We're gonna be mm -hmm. broke, and your mind can 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 really rob you of a lot of things. And I think when we're, we're talking about wealth. It's like if you're worrying about something, you're not wealthy. Or if you're always checking something, you're not wealthy. And again, there are people with billions of dollars that, you know, that, there, there's been more than one multi billionaire that has, you know, committed suicide for reasons unbeknownst to, to the general public. Just like we all know people who live in a small, you know, the house they've lived in forever that are some of the most satisfied, most content people out there. So again, it's the psychology between the number, the numbers, the the the, the childhood hood stories that kind of like pulls it all together. And I really do believe that to really be wealthy is to be at peace with all of those different components. But people trick themselves, right? People mm. the humble, like, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. I do that. And I call and I call bullshit on most yeah. people. I'm like, come on. This is better. You know, yeah. one of my business partners, Andrew, 
He like came up with almost like the really amazing Frosted Flakes slogan. It's great, mm-hmm. or they're great. I forget what it is. And they're, then yeah. they're great. Then maybe it's you who that's it's great. Um, but he, you know, said to me once, it's just better. Like there are certain things in life that are better. Like it is better to fly first class. Anyone who's saying it's not better to fly first class, like that's just factually, patently a lie. Like you have more overhead space. You have a better ratio to the bathroom. You have more extra space. You probably have a bigger screen. Like it's better. Whether or not you want to spend the money on it, that's a separate discussion. But let's just start with it's better. Is it better to be in a more comfortable car? Sure. Is it better to have some more space? Yeah. Like there's all these. Nicer there's mattress. Like, right. There's certain yeah. things in life that are better. Then trying to marry that together where you have marginal utility of value, uh, that's, that's, the the, that's the trick. And that's where, again, I tell people, again, in my two-way interview, like, if you're going to work with me, I'm going to push you. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't mind you telling me to fuck off sometimes. Yeah. That's cool. But we, we've got to have these conversations about where is utility for you? Are you stuck in some old construct that's actually not providing you joy? You know, it sounds so obvious, but it's like telling people what they like and, you know, culture and media and the Joneses and all that. That's why I'm so pro renting. I think buying a house is a phenomenal investment, especially when interest rates were so much so low. It, it's like an it's a it's a personal leverage buyout is I always think of a, of a, of a house, a per, personal I would, ag- I would agree with that. Uh, in, in low I rates. don't think your in, your res primary is an investment, but yes, it is everyone in this country's most intimate experience with leverage, which does mm-hmm. cut both ways. But yeah, it's crazy, crazy leverage. And so, so the thing about buying a home for me and, and why I choose to rent is because I am so acutely aware of what my preferences are. Mm-hmm. I value optionality. I value simplicity. Mm-hmm. I value picking up the phone and being like, come fix this. Mm-hmm. I also, I'm not terrified of rent increases. Like I don't mm-hmm. love them, but I'm, mm-hmm. I don't, Yes, there are times when I'm bummed that, you know, it doesn't, there's some change that I want to make, but it's economically not worth making because I'll be paying for the next renters to, to do that. So, so to me, this rent versus buy is like, how well do you understand your preferences? Well, I so tell everyone, you, yeah, yeah. you know, I, that one's a really, a really relevant one. So one of the most inertial forms of wealth creations or validations is, oh, I guess I should buy a place. I've arrived, right? I just took out a big secondary. I got five million bucks at them, which probably means they still have 50 in the business. And whoever bought the five thinks their 50 is going to be worth 150 to 250, right? So that's the game that we're talking about here. And so people will say, I guess I should buy a place. And I deal with a lot of coasts. So, you know, it doesn't get you so much. And they want to use leverage, which a bank doesn't think they're rich. I always say what, what I think you can afford and a bank thinks you can afford aren't the same thing. But I start with one phrase, which will resonate with you, which is, you got to love where you live. You don't have to own it. And I want people to wake up every day on this planet, if they can, going back to the wealth comment, and love where you live. Feel amazing. Feel energized. And that means you should rent it sometimes. And it's it's not throwing away money. That's such a traditional, conventional way of thinking about it. And I do think that that's a big one, though, in terms of how to think about using that money. And, and I, I would say most of the time, I convince people not to buy hmm. because it really, it doesn't make sense. So I'm like, okay, you own a $3 million condo in New York City that you hate, mm-hmm. but you own it, you yeah. arrived, mm-hmm. or go rent something for 25 grand. Again, I'm, I, I know these are big numbers, but I'm like, just, it should be sick. You should wake up every morning. You should want to have your friends over. You should want to have community. You should want to be able to go into the office and feel successful. Mm-hmm. And if you can, I think that that's a big deal for people. So, you know, and sometimes it's funny, like some of the advice I give people, they're like, that's not really what other people give. I'm like, <laughs> in some ways I'm an enabling advisor because I mm-hmm. enable people. Because the thing that I would, I, one of the comments that I do want to make though, is because of the types of people I tend to work with, I explain the only competition for you living an amazing lifestyle is some terminal value you've decided your kids should get when you die or charity should get when you die. Most people I work with, when I start showing them numbers, are like, I don't have an emotional attachment to any of these numbers. Meaning, most of them, are gonna, the kids are going to start with a lot more than I ever would have. And, you know, because again, compounding, right? You're showing them these ridiculous numbers. And I'm like, so wait, you don't want to like travel with the family that way or celebrate your parents' 80th birthday this way be so that your kids have what? Like, do you care about that? And they're like, no. 
again, scarcity and fear drives people, as you say, though. So Yeah. So there's a phrase that I've been thinking about often, which is, I think Naval Ravikant said it, and it says, money can only solve money problems. And so you you have a lens into a world where if if there's a money problem, you know, if broken, you know, septic tank or even like some medical thing, but money can only solve money problems. And I remember I spoke to someone who was, you know, he was a down the fairway entrepreneur, you know, he had done okay, but, you know, still very, you know, very financially comfortable. And then he had a huge exit. Mm-hmm. He came to me and he's like, okay, I realized that all of the problems that could be solved by money, I had solved them before I sold my company. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole other set, set and one that I've seen very often being in just, I meet people all the time. And maybe it's the age that we're in is people have family problems. They have issues with their parents. They have issues with their siblings. They have issues with their cousins. They have, you know, issues with their spouse. Yep. Right? Money, it it can help at the margins. It can buy you therapists, basically. And it can buy you you therapists and can buy you time to go see therapists. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I know many people with a lot of money who don't think they have the time to go see therapists. By the way, that's just so you know, when people have these liquidity events, I'm like, I need you to have a mental trainer in your life and a physical trainer in Mm -hmm. your life unacceptable to not. I need you to have a chef or a part-time chef. Like, you know, there's all these Mm -hmm. things I start pushing people to do because I'm like, otherwise, what are you doing with the money? Like, this is what this, you you need this stuff. Sorry, keep going. And and even in in your case, I mean, you're talking to people who have big exits, but a mental trainer is also a therapist that's covered by your insurance. A hundred percent. And a health trainer is also known as a Peloton subscription or Correct. or a group called Barry's Bootcamp, you know, $30, $30 workout. You know, you've seen people that have made it and made it in spectacular financial ways. And there's a lot of people that are like, oh, all my problems will go away once I have this, if only I had this exit, if only I had this promotion, if only I bought this house, if only I paid off my student loans. Given what you've seen what do you say to that person that thinks that they're just some financial event away from solving all their problems? Right. It's interesting. You know, one of the things you said, which is, you know, I've sort of parallel path some of this myself. So similar to you, I, I coach with a lot of descriptions of how I think about some of it because it's relevant. And it is interesting because some of the things, I think money helps in ways that people discount. Meaning I actually do think It helps quite a bit with certain elements of family dynamics. It does help a lot with parental support. Like there are things you can do that without money would be quite stressful. You know, your kid goes through something and and you and I know this as a personal. And like there's some healthcare in this country that's quite inaccessible that's not covered by insurance. And so I do think there are things, but again, that curve will flatten out relatively quickly. But I think that, you know, it's really figuring out your proverbial true north as you get that money, have intentionality around it. Be careful to create expectation and deal with judgment with your money. So sometimes people try to fix a family problem by throwing money at different pieces of the family. And what they don't realize is you actually did the proverbial, you know, you you gave them the fish You didn't teach them how to fish unintentionally. They also think the fish market is open for quite a bit of time. Mm -hmm. You also could unintentionally create discomfort where people feel like they owe you. So you have to be really careful about the conversations about financial support to people. And then I I think that, you know, you can't solve certain fundamental dynamics with friends and family with money. I would say that one thing I do think you can do is money makes it easier. I'm not saying you can't do it with less to make memories with your nuclear family. If you can have a second place to go, that's sort of the family retreat that's on a lake or by the beach. And it's like, it just creates different physical location and different memories. Like that's a big deal. You know, I I have a place on a lake that I called it my memory maker when I got it. And it has been not only a memory maker for my kids, but for dozens of my friends' kids. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. 
right? That is awesome, awesome, awesome. Like, I do think that that matters. And I'm not saying you can't just go camping with a lot less money with a tent. And you can, but absent being that mindset, I do think there's things that you can do that can create memories, that can create a boomerang. I think everyone's very fearful. You know, you talk about numerators and denominators. All of our 18 years in our house felt a lot longer than our kids' 18 years in our house. And so, you know, we all want to figure out how to elongate the kids to come back. And so I think that there's a lot of boomerang elements that we all want as parents so that our kids want to be with us. And sometimes it's as simple as having that great beach house. Mm -hmm. And it may seem weird, but like it's sort of reality. So I do think there are some things. But again, at some point you check off the boxes and like you can't Mm -hmm. fix a relationship with your mom with money. You can't like shower her with gifts or like go on a vacation. I mean, listen, you could, of course, buy therapists, as you said. So I do think that there are elements that money will never fix. If anything, sometimes the money makes it worse. That being said, there are definitely categories that I believe, you know, having a looser grip on your digits Mm -hmm. with the three digit rule can actually be pretty impactful. Yeah. Last question, but it might be a long one. (laughs) You have seen people your clients, your peers, yourself that have built long-term wealth for themselves and for and for their families. If you had to parse out a series of traits or habits or patterns, you said you're very good at pattern recognition. And I don't want I know is like to, to, to say that we're going to come up with something pithy and actionable is like, it, it's, it's, it's ironic, right? It kind of like would defeat the whole purpose. But what are some of the kind of, when you pattern match on kind of long-term wealth, again, not necessarily rich, right? I mean, rich is probably a component of it, but wealth, what do you see as the kind of overlapping elements of that, uh, of that pattern? Sure. Risk-taking. Hmm. I don't think that most people are willing to take a lot of risks. I think there's the romantic version of what people see from wealth creators, but the risk people took to get there isn't visible. So I think part of it is there's a general comfort with risk taking. I think there is the comfort of repetition. I have said some of the things I've said thousands and thousands of times but I pride myself on each time it sounding like the first time I said it with the same energy and passion. So I think a lot of the people I see have been in so many rooms so many times saying so many of the same things, oftentimes not received with all the glee that maybe it looks like they must have. I think that there's that perseverance and ability to be a, a little maniacal around repetition. I think in general... It's people willing to not only play the long game, which we're talking about, but also play a different game. Mm-hmm. You know, they get that piece of paper and they always like the, the fill in the blank answers, not the multiple choice answers. Mm-hmm. I think some of those traits is I'm trying to like meld together a little bit about myself, yeah. but a little mm-hmm. bit about, the, and listen, we both know there's outliers and like when we yeah. create a Venn diagram, we're trying to get to 50, 60, 70%. I would argue that's the most you can get to of, of homogeneity. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's people I work with that are pure hustlers. Mm-hmm. There are people I work with that are, you know, Harvard, Harvard, Stanford, you know, sort of like it just looks like the yeah. right archetype. And, you know, the thing that we talk a lot about, you and I, and that I talk a lot about with my family is, you know, to say that people work really, really hard is such, such an injustice. So many people work really, really hard. You got to be lucky. And we all can come up with, oh, you make your own luck and this and that. I think that's a throwaway. I think that there's just some luck and and people win some of the right lotteries and people win some of the wrong lotteries. And I think one of the things that I notice, which I think a lot of people that I work with do, is that you've got to be mindful of, you know, to, to create wealth, let's just say financial wealth to get to all the other wealth. A few things had to happen to get you there. And essentially, you had to win, right? You had to win something, right? You had to win mandates. You had to win business. You had to win a market share. And 
a lot of times when you win, you sometimes don't take the time. This is like one of my big frameworks mm -hmm. to remember someone else lost most likely, if not many other people lost. But you don't really take the time to be like, oh man, especially in my business, like was there someone else that was talking to this entrepreneur for five years also, or even was talking to them for five years and then through someone else, they met me five days ago. You know, all you might say, oh wow, this is an amazing, as I call it, rogue wave, like someone I didn't even know about came my way. And I started years ago being like, I wonder if there's another version of me that had been spending their time. And the reason I did this is because, you know, as I joked, I'm not a real venture capitalist, so I don't get a permanent spot on the cap table. So, you know, once in a while, someone that I've been helping for five, 10 years actually goes in another direction when they get the liquidity event. And that loss, right, we all know loss aversion is like 5x to gain elation, yeah. was so bad. And, the, and then I said to myself, hold on a second, Adam. How many times am I on the other end of this? Massively outweighs that. And so I think that really su successful entrepreneurs have that self-awareness of like a lot of hard work, a lot of repetition, a lot of that time machine jumping ahead 10 years, looking back, not feeling the urgency, creating real loyalty to whatever they're doing and finding other markers of success along the way. Mm -hmm. and, like and knowing that this success that we're talking about in the financial sense was the lagging indicator of how they felt mm -hmm. along the journey. And I think a lot of people struggle with what I call the lily pads, right? You're jumping across the river. If you don't have any lily pads, you probably can't make it, nor could you even see it. But you can see the lily pads that are close. So you can see them, and then you can jump to them. And I think yeah. by finding those intermediate sources of success, and in this case, you know, being an entrepreneur and just taking that each one at, 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 in stride and, and again, being self-aware that there was some luck and that there was probably someone who's feeling pretty bad about the win you just had, I think keeps you humble and keeps you, you know, gracious. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said, man. Yeah, and if I reflect back on our conversation, you know, I, I do love this thing about what you said about risk. I think people don't talk about risk enough. I, entrepreneurs talk about risk to one another, but y y there's a part, and I'm realizing this eight years as an entrepreneur, you 12, 13, is like there's a part of you that is a little bit off, right? Uh, and it's a little exactly. bit I use what I say, maniacal, right? Yeah, yeah it's you have maniacal, to it's obsessive, but it also it kind of disregards statistical probabilities, meaning Correct. that that you the statistics of any small business are are atrocious, and you need to be a little bit off to say like I'm gonna you know I'm gonna go swim in these really choppy waters, and again I think you know it keeps coming back. I mean this is why this is called the Examine Life podcast. Is so many of the things that we've talked about, whether it's how you spend your money, how you take the risk, how you define success and wealth on your own terms all require a tremendous amount of self-awareness, intentionality, and creativity to create that own story. And I, I still, you know, I feel honored that you, you know, you've called me, you know, extremely wealthy because I know that on your client list, like I, I needed to, you know, they needed an exception waiver to, uh, <laughs> oh, stop. to, to, to stop let that. me in. Um, but it, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful reminder of like, I'm so passionate about what I do is that a fast way to fast track wealth, the full continuum of wealth is that self-awareness and that examined that that self-examination. And then all the other the the all the other mad libs, the puzzle pieces, they don't fall into place. Like you need obsession, you need grit, you need consistency, but they have a greater likelihood of falling into place and ultimately leading to the life that you want to build. Agreed, buddy. Well, my friend, this was incredible. Where you're, you're, you're a private person, but where, where can people go learn, learn more about you and how you spend your time? I guess you can Google my name, but don't <laughs> Google it with arm wrestling because then you'll find some fun videos. All right. Nice little Easter egg for those of you listening till the very end. Adam, my friend, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for all of the pearls and, and bombs of, of wisdom. <laughs> And uh, I know we're going to be doing this again. Appreciate right, well, you. Well, thanks for inviting me on. And it's really fun to, again, have some, some eavesdroppers for one of the first times to these fun conversations. So hopefully it, it helps some other folks. All right. Take care, man. All right, buddy. Bye.